Hello everyone, Inside HR is back this morning to bring you another hour of discussion on the latest issues, topics and trends affecting HR and management practitioners. Today we're going to be talking all about the real impact of maternity coaching in association with My Family Care and we've got some fascinating new research and two great guests to introduce to you in just a moment. Before that, um, I just want to let you know we are using a slightly different platform this morning. It's an upgrade on our previous platform with Bright Talk. Um, but for the audience listening, you should see pretty much the same uh, thing, the same functionality. Let me just walk you through how you can get involved this morning. We love you to get involved here at Inside H HR. You can vote in our polls. You can ask questions that I will put to our guests, uh, both at the middle and at the end of the webinar. We've got two uh, spaces for questions um, this hour. Um, we can rate the webinar. You can rate the webinar as well, um, and we really do appreciate uh, all the feedback that you give us constantly. It's really useful for us. Um, and you can download and click on links and resources related to, to today's topics by uh, looking at the attachments button as well, which you'll see underneath the deck on your screen. Um, you'll find all of those buttons uh, to do all of the things that I've just said uh, below there. Um, and you can also follow us on Twitter and get all um, the latest HR news via either at HR Review or HR Review dot co dot uk so um let me uh, introduce our two guests to you this morning for regular listeners of inside hr you will uh, definitely recognize one of them uh, and uh, she comes from my family care who you will know well from other inside hr webinars that we've done they're a leading provider of solutions for employers and their employees for combining work and family they partner with employers to provide services including online solutions such as coaching toolkits webinars uh, and other content, practical services such as backup care, and of course, individual and group coaching and consultancy services, which is what we're going to talk about today. And I'm very pleased to uh, welcome their director of head, and co and head of coaching and consultancy, Jennifer Liston-Smith. Uh, Jennifer, great to have you back this morning. Thank you, James, and hello all. Great to be back. Um, so Jennifer's part of my family care senior management team. She heads up coaching and consultancy services, supporting uh, leading employers to retain their talent. Um, and she's a frequent conference speaker, writer, media commentator on the topic of what employers can do to help people combine career and family. Um, and Jennifer was also one of the original pioneers of maternity coaching in the UK, uh, which makes her obviously the ideal guest for us this morning. Um, her team has coached thousands of working parents and their line managers through this transition since the early 2000s. Um, and uh, Jennifer, you're going to be discussing in detail some of the programs um, My Family Care are currently providing to some of your clients, leading employers. Is that right? Absolutely. Really looking forward to sharing that, James. Brilliant. And we've got with us also um, uh, Jane Moffat, who's done some amazing research. Um, uh, Jane, good morning. How are you? Hi. Uh, very well, thank you. Lovely to be speaking to you. Jane, it's great to have you with us. Um, Jane studied for um, a Master's in Coaching and Behavioral Change um, at Henley Business School and undertook independent research for her final dissertation through a study of individuals who've been coached by My Family Care Coaches. Uh, Jane has a professional background in L&D, learning and development, uh, and has spent 20 years working with women during the transition uh, to motherhood and performing various roles with the NCT, the UK's largest parenting charity. Um, Jane also has a solid grounding in evidence-based practice and integrates this knowledge with the skills of training, facilitating, coaching, and counseling. So I hope you'll all agree the two ideal people we've got with us on Inside HR this morning to talk about maternity coaching. And let's take you uh, to what we're going to talk about today. So let's have a look at our agenda. Firstly, um, as is traditional on Inside HR, we're going to launch our first poll, and I'll bring that to you very shortly, right after I've, uh, I've run down the agenda for us. Um, we're going to talk about the need and potential solution, the need for coaching and the potential solutions that are out there. We're going to talk about the, uh, your results, uh, your feedback from our polls, um, and we're going to have two polls for you today as well. Um, and then we're going to get into the real impact um, of maternity coaching, and we're going to have those insights from the research that Jane has done, and also some case studies from Jennifer some, from some of the clients that my family care are working with right now before taking a look at the bigger picture um, and then answering all of your questions. So that's a pretty packed hour ahead of us. Um, uh, we're going to take a look at um, all of the things that you can do as, empl as employers in terms of management capability, policies, and practical enablers um, before we get into those questions. So please do. You can click on that questions button and you can send us all of those. Um, before, what, what we're going to do first is launch into our first poll, and I've just got that coming up on my screen now. Bear with me. Here we go. So 
What we're going to ask you is a very simple question to get us started on this topic. Which statement best describes where your organization is at on the maternity and paternity coaching front? Is it uh, we're looking for ideas to get started in this area? Or is it option two, we have a successful parental leave coaching program already in place? Is it option three, we have parental leave coaching program but, and we're reviewing it generally? Is it option four, we're mostly looking at what we can do with a small budget? I know that you know, my business is constantly uh, uh, in, that, in that predicament. Um, and, or is it option five, we are mostly looking to reach a widespread population across the UK or maybe even globally if you're a large, larger multinational organization. So please um, click on the poll, um, uh, the vote now button um, and answer that poll um, and those results will shape our debate. Um, and we'll look at those in about 20 minutes time uh, or so. Um, so let's dive right in. Jennifer, I'm going to turn to you first. You've been designing programs for leading clients in this area for nearly 15 years now. And am I right in saying it's almost become a hygiene factor now? Employers know that they need to do something about the parent transition and it's crucial if they want to attract and retain talented people. So just walk us through the need for these solutions and the drivers that uh, can help companies address this. Absolutely, James. I mean, it has become about being an employer of choice, attracting mm. and then crucially retaining talent. A lot of the clients that we work with are in sectors where there is a real need to retain knowledgeable, capable people, so financial and professional services, including law firms, um, STEM sector employers, science, tech, engineering, maths, mm. you know, those sectors where People may be 10 years into their career when they have a child. It's a really crucial loss if you can't keep that person on board and keep their career progressing with a child. So it becomes a factor in, in how to be a great employer, and employers compete with each other to be doing the right thing in a way in this area. And I know we're going to talk about some of the financial drivers in a little while, but one of the things we've noticed is it often starts with the kinds of myths that we've got on the screen at the moment becoming obvious to people. There are behaviors, mm. there are assumptions. Um, and we can see here, for example, if we look top right there, the, the quote from a returning parent, you know, it must just be me that's not quite coping. A lot of us, as a parent myself, I've got two teenage boys, you know, there can be a, a maintaining of a, a facade, I'm, I'm doing all right through gritted teeth. Um, and one of our engineering clients the other day, an HR business partner, talked about how she'd sat down with a returning mother who was really struggling, thinking she was the only one who wasn't quite coping. And actually, by having a good conversation, it's an organization in which we work with the individuals, but we've also um, created ambassadors among the HR business partners and they're, they're upskilled to have really good coaching conversations with individuals and they can reassure people, normalize the challenges, help people find solutions and then instead of it being an issue that impacts engagement and performance in a bad way, it can be really engaging. So, you know, for the individual themselves, we can see top left, there's a quote from a, a, a father, a partner um, who, you know, Dads these days can be wary about being too much of a pioneer if they take mm. shared parental leave. You know, am I, um, am I being too counterculture? So that can be something where, again, employers can make real gains by saying, look, we are inclusive, we're gender neutral about enabling people to combine work and family, and that, again, can be a huge engagement plus. And it's not just parents that are holding back on having those conversations. It's also managers as well, isn't it, Jennifer? Right from the outset of addressing this field, as you say, back about 15 years now, we've said, you know, it takes two to tango. It's, it's a two-sided conversation. If we can upskill one side, if we can upskill the parent to be more proactive and have influential conversations and great planning, that's great. But, it, you know, if we can also engage managers and, you know, let's face it, we as managers are busy. There's lots to do. It can be all too easy either to avoid the conversation. Like it says there, it might be better to say nothing in case I put my foot in it. Or we can find we, we say the wrong thing. You know, somebody announces they're expecting a baby. And before we know it, out of our mouths comes that sort of, oh, um, not, not next May, surely, with the big product launch. <laughs> and, you know, just the, just the worst thing to say. So how do we give managers some simple, practical, checklists that help them have that conversation confidently. Brilliant. Um, let me just remind our audience because um, uh, who might have struggled to find the poll on our new platform, let me just remind them of that poll and what's going on. We've already got lots of you voting, so thank you very much for that. 
Um, which statement best describes where your organization is at on the maternity and paternity coaching front? Is it, one, we're looking for ideas to get started in this area. Two, we have a successful um, parental leave coaching program already in place. Is it three, we have a parental leave coaching program and we're reviewing it currently. Um, is it four, we're mostly looking at what we can do with a small budget. Or is it five, we're mostly looking to reach a widespread property a multinational uh, company, perhaps that's, that's where you're sitting at the moment. Just a reminder that those buttons are underneath your slide deck. So if you click on the vote um, tab that is underneath there, um, you'll be able to access that poll. And therefore, what we'll do is we'll just give you a few more minutes to get involved with that. Um, so rather than moving on to those poll results, we'll move a little bit further and we'll talk about the options for employers, Jennifer. So we've, we've talked about this um, quite a lot before. So um, in the early to mid sort of 2000s, maternity leave was lengthening, but leaks in the pipeline began to emerge, and employers could see that it, it might help to offer other individual coaching to key people who were going through maternity leave. Um, options have developed quite a bit since then, haven't they, Jennifer? Just, just talk us through some of the different options that can be put in place, particularly um, some of those at lower cost, because we know that some of our audiences won't be working for enormous organizations. They'll mm -hmm. be doing this on a small budget. So there's, lots, there's a whole range of options that companies can consider now, aren't there? Absolutely, James. And you know, whatever option you're looking to put in place, whether it's internal resource or external providers, you'll want to make a business case, and we're going to help with some um, maths around that later on. Um, but yes, there are lots of things to do. When we first embarked on um, doing something in this area, it was you know we could see there was an engagement issue around the potentially longer leave period that was coming up in the early to mid 2000s. We looked at one-to-one -one support, and still many of our clients have blended programs where you might have individual one-to-one -one coaching, perhaps for the key people, the top talents, the most senior people, and you might have a, a group coaching program for the middle population and indeed online resources. And this is really crucial if you have a widespread population, whether they're widespread across the UK or widespread globally. If you can provide something online and you know on a low budget, that could be simply tidying up what's there on the internet, making sure that there's a really accessible, engaging page for new parents, dads included, partners included, obviously same-sex partners included. Um, but we have a, an online parental leave toolkit that we've created that guides people and helps them plan through the whole period of leave, both the individual and the manager, from before the transition to return. And that's a, a fantastic way of reaching a global audience, as is virtual coaching. So while we started a lot face-to-face, -face, mm. um, it's now moved much more because of that widespread population that needs to be reached to virtual. And you can do virtual group coaching. You can have fantastic conversations like we're having today by webinar, which can be very interactive. And are you, Jennifer, are you, are you, is it common practice to be tying those in with things like the keeping in touch days, the kit days as well, so it all sort of links together? Yeah, I mean, we, we innovated literally 10 years ago with one of our banking clients to take a keeping in touch day. And, you know, as, as many of the audience will know, you can have up to 10 keeping in touch days during a maternity or adoption leave or up to 20 shared parental leave in touch days, days when you mm. can work and be paid. But how about taking one of those days, as we've been doing with a lot of clients, and saying, well, let's put into that day a business update, some group coaching, some meetings with managers. Let's make that a day in which we invite people to come in. And we even provide pop-up crashes in some of our client organizations to support that day. So you make it a really happening networking event out of a Keeping in Touch Day. And that's something you can do internally as well as with external support. Um, and obviously, not to forget, in all of this, managers can be served. You know, obviously, they can have meetings on a Keeping in Touch Day, but they can be served through all of these different formats as well, one-to-one -one briefings and coaching for managers, online resources, group discussions. Um, it's so crucial. One of those quotes on the slide that we had earlier was how you know, managers can accidentally sideline people by yeah. taking pressing work from people, taking demanding work away from a new returner by the assumption that they want an easier life, and that can actually be much better addressed by asking what the person wants to be involved sure. in. So again, you know, all sorts of things that will help managers just become more aware of what's needed.
Brilliant. And we're going to, obviously with you, we're going to get into three case studies, so three really interesting companies that we're going to talk about shortly. Just before we do that, um, let me bring you those results of that poll that we talked about earlier. Um, so which statement best describes where your organization is at on the maternity or paternity coaching front at the moment? Two-thirds of our audience, 66%, said that we are looking for ideas to get started in this area. So uh, needless to say, you've obviously come to the right place, and hopefully you'll get all of the answers over the next 40 minutes or so. Um, and also, let me draw your attention right now to the attachment um, button at the underneath your slide deck where you can uh, have a look at summaries of the case studies that we're about to discuss right now, but also loads of resources and links from My Family Care as well to get you started with some ideas there. Jennifer, let's talk about um, learning from existing case studies. So mm -hmm. there's, we've got three organizations that you've worked with here, um, and let's talk a little about how My Family Care, um, uh, and the, working with these companies, they've created sort of blending learning programs like the ones you were talking about earlier to suit their different populations and needs. And, and I guess the key sort of theme here is that there is a flexibility with this. You can tailor, um, make a program to suit your organization. What sort of combinations of different types of coaching have you been delivering with these companies? Yeah, absolutely, James. So, I mean, these are just three examples mm. um, of organizations whose case studies you can download from the My Family Care website, which is myfamilycare.co.uk. Um, there are many case studies on there because we work with a whole range of, of leading organizations, but these are three that have kindly allowed us to, to publish case studies, um, and they do illustrate quite nicely the different blends that you can have. Um, I mean, we should mention beyond these cases, um, there was a mention of mentors and internal buddies on the previous mm. slide. They're not talked about in these cases, but that is something for, for organizations that are just starting um, and also looking at a low budget. We've often been involved oil companies, financial service companies, law firms, um, all of those kind of settings in upskilling internal mentors, so that's quite an important one. But looking at these three on the screen here, so with Sky, for example, and they've gone on to win multiple awards for being family friendly and being a great employer. And an important plank of that has been the wonderful Parents at Sky group. Um, somebody called Catherine Oliver and her team initiated this internally as volunteers alongside their day job and reached out to us and we really helped them build a whole raft of services. And amongst those were um, group coaching sessions for parents and, and crucially a separate stream for dads and partners making sure that that role in the transition was, was really paid attention to. And Sky is an example where we, we do provide a pop-up crash on the day for the Keeping in Touch Day where we provide group Fantastic. coaching. And we also provide in Sky a session, not only do we provide the sessions sort of tightly around the maternity transition itself and paternity transition, so we provide just before you go off on leave, during leave on a kit day, and about a month or so post-leave. But we also provide a session for people that have been back about six months or longer because that's a time when you're really trying to get your head around the day-to-day -day challenges. So that's an interesting one. And Sky have really embraced this, and I know that we've talked when we've when we've worked with you before uh, with my family care with Inside HR. We've talked a lot about Sky as a fantastic example of their sort of family friendly policies, their maternity and paternity policies. Let's move to a slightly different organisation, Norton Rose Fulbright. Um, you've done a bit of group coaching there, Jennifer, and other things. Just talk us through what you've done with them, because obviously they're a quite different business. Absolutely. So, so as a leading law firm, um, you know, again, very important, talented people that you don't want to lose when, when they go through the maternity transition. They will have questions about their ongoing career. How do I make it all work? How do I have it all? Um, and so we felt that together with the firm when we were crafting this program, it was very much felt that a group coaching session where people can exchange their challenges and their solutions, they can be facilitated to think through that all-important task of, of deciding who are the stakeholders in this transition and how do I influence them, how do I plan great conversations. And one of the things that we've done there, which it works really nicely, is we have the, the two sessions, the, the pre-leave and the post-leave group, on the same day, and the firm provides a networking lunch between those two sessions. So that's a really nice way of having a network that people can relate to. And you've also done quite a lot of work there with, specifically with the line managers as well, not just with the parents. Absolutely. The firm's done some great stuff with producing really helpful packs for individuals and managers. And this is something that, that you know, other people listening can do, whether or not you're bringing in external coaching. 
instead of a, a sort of bland policy, why not make it into a nice pack that looks attractive, that's written accessibly and friendly, you know, in a friendly style? Um, and so we worked with the firm to do that, including a pack for managers, and then we helped launch an initial briefing, best practice briefing for those in a management role, which the firm then took forward themselves. So that's a really nice way of, of um, making sure that managers are resourced as well. Mm. And then our last example, again, a very different organization again, a very dispersed organization, an enormous global organization, mm -hmm. IBM. Um, so talk to us a little bit about your experience with them and what they're doing. Absolutely. So IBM has been a client of, of My Family Care for many, many years now. And our program has evolved over time. And initially, we were providing group coaching face-to-face -face in the room in various different locations. And ultimately, in line with who IBM are, it became clear that a virtual program was going to be the key. Um, and so now we provide virtual coaching by webinar, um, after which the individuals can access follow-up coaching by phone, should they wish to do that. And most people do, because it's really helpful when you've had that virtual room that you're sitting in, you're thinking about taking your actions forward to get access to a coach, the same coach that's led that discussion, who can help you think in a nice confidential phone coaching space about how you actually apply your actions in practice. And then importantly, that is backed up by the parental leave toolkits for individuals and managers. So what happens there is, is it's an online resource. It takes a couple of minutes to type in you know, the type of leave you're taking and the dates you expect to go off on leave and the dates you expect to return. And the, the system, the parental leave toolkit, will make, create a plan for you that then pushes out reminders and checklists and helpful tools and video tips at the right intervals of that transition to, to kind of keep you resourced and confident. Fantastic. So three very different businesses there. As Jennifer said, you can uh, look at the case studies either on My Family Care's website or by clicking on the attachment uh, button at the bottom of your slide deck there that will give you links to those case studies. Um, Jennifer, going back to something you mentioned with Sky, you mentioned dads and partners workshops there, and that's increasingly something employers are thinking about that parenthood isn't just about mums it's about dads and partners um, as well um, talk to us a little bit more about how that's changed over the last few years because this is a relatively modern realization isn't it Absolutely, yes. And, you know, we used the word maternity coaching. We, we discussed it, didn't we, in the title of this webinar, mm -hmm. and we, we recognized it's still a buzzword for many people. But actually, increasingly, it's parent transition coaching. We have to be inclusive. The world is very much moving towards a shared model of parenting, pressure from both parts of a, a parenting relationship, whether male, female, or same sex, for it to be a shared endeavor, that's for sure. Obviously, many people do do solo parenting as well. But where there are two parents, these days they both expect to be involved. And those employers that have managed particularly to enhance pay for shared parental leave, or even if they haven't enhanced pay, where they've managed to really promote it and encourage it, have found huge engagement payoffs from that. So it is really important to remember that shared parental leave exists not only to help dads and partners be involved parents, but also ultimately to remove the the prejudice and stigma potentially that women experience where employers mm. are thinking, mm, will you be taking time out for a child? Now that could be either parent. Mm. Um, so what we're talking about here obviously is making sure that both parents are involved. Um, what we're going to throw up on the next slide that you're going to see uh, in just a second is, is that basically what we're talking about here is almost a leadership development program, isn't it? And I know, Jennifer, you've commented before that it's, it's a very developmental transition. Um, it can look like hard work, um, but if we haven't thought about working parenthood's role in developing leaders and from an organizational perspective, then we're missing a trick, aren't we? You're so right, James. And we can easily think about it in a deficit model, you know, time out for having children and then the, the challenges of coping. And we can fall into overuse of the word support in this area. Whereas actually, you know, people develop phenomenally when they are balancing looking after another human being or a whole family with their career. And they can become very determined, very ambitious to make it work, very good at prioritizing and multitasking. You know, if you can get a two-year-old to get Get their shoes on in time to get to the nursery before work you can probably negotiate with a room full of you know senior managers yeah. um so, so actually well, what we're saying here is that we're, we're we're undervaluing the development and the skills that um, parents are picking up through balancing work and professional life uh, work and sorry domestic life thank you for yes and all of our coaches are you know 
ultimately leadership and career development coaches with a specialism in mm. this parent transition and in all the, the relevant themes of that because it is it is a time of huge development that we can we can harness and if we don't if we if we do the transition badly then it can it can feel like a um, a pull between you know an either or work or family but if we do it well we can we can see the development of the the person both professionally and, and personally Brilliant. So, Jennifer, we're going to talk in a lot more detail slightly later on about the numbers and, and the kind of impacts that this can have. Um, but, Jane, I'd like to bring you in now. Jane Moffat, you were, you were studying for your Master's in Coaching and Behavioral Change at Henley, Henley Business School, and you decided that for your research you wanted to get under the skin of really under the skin and really understand what happens in terms of maternity coaching. So let me, correct me if I get this wrong, so you, you approached My Family Care um, uh, and got, a, got permission from a range of their client organizations for you to conduct interviews with a number of their coachees. Just sort of talk us through the process and also just tell us a little bit about what inspired you to do this particular research. Yes, James, that's right. When I approached them, My Family Care kindly agreed to be part of my research project, putting me in contact with women who had previously received coaching provided by them. Um, and I interviewed 11 women working for different organizations, really inviting them to reflect on the experience of being coached. Having spent 20 years as a practitioner for the NCT, working with parents in the perinatal period from pregnancy through to a year after birth, I have long had an interest in this time of great change for people. New parenthood can feel like an amazing but chaotic time, and I've listened to thousands of parents talk about their experiences. Having also been involved in learning and development for NCT, I'm int intrigued by how people view the world and how training and coaching can play a part in increasing self-awareness and developing a curiosity into how others think and behave. So when it sure. came to the point in my master's to choose a research topic... Mm. Mm. My previous work experience, my interest in coaching, led me to choose to find out more about the transitions out of and back into the workplace. I wanted to, to discover what people who had had maternity coaching said about how and why it had helped them, and I was really lucky to be able to work with My Family Care on this project. Fantastic. And the first thing we're going to look at here is, is a, a really key thing um, uh, that, that I think you found in, in terms of your, your conversations with these 11 women that you spoke to, was that they really felt like their identity had changed. And we've got a quote up on the screen that our audience can all see now, and, and it, it's, it's a quote that says um, uh, that there's one of these, the women that you spoke to wanted to scream at, at, at someone, my life has fundamentally changed. And there's a sort of uh, the implication is there that, that people just don't, are still not quite understanding how fundamental the change is uh, for parents, uh, particularly first-time parents. Just tell us a little bit more about what you found. Yes, that's right. So that quote from that uh, woman, she'd just been standing in a lift with somebody uh, on, you know, when she'd been back at work for a couple of days, yeah. and uh, this man said, oh, you, you look well. Uh, uh, wh where have you been? And she said, well, I've you know, been off on maternity leave, and he sort of looked at her as if she'd just been on holiday to the Maldives or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and she was, um, you know, she really felt, you know, it's really, it's really different for me. And, you know, and the transition to motherhood is a recognised time of profound psychological change. And so although people might be the same professional at work that they were beforehand, they often feel differently, which can impact on confidence and engagement. Uh, sorry, Jen, and is there a sense that that change, that fundamental change of identity, isn't being understood within organizations at the moment? I think from what some of the women were saying, that that's the case, that they're appearing the same at work, um, but there has been this big shift, and certainly the coaching seemed to help align their new identity with their behavior at work. Um, Sometimes it was done by encouraging the women to articulate their values and beliefs, their priorities and aspirations, and then seeing how those fitted in with their approach to work. Mm. Um, it could be that you, the use of positive psychology in the coaching session helped to change, um, uh, ch helps somebody to change their mindset. There was someone who said she became much more positive and energized in her approach to work, and that was really noticed by her bosses and, and commented on. Um, and another woman just described herself as behaving like a swan at work, looking calm on the surface, 
but madly paddling underneath. Yeah. And, and the coach had really helped her to present herself well in all the various situations and guises. Those were the words of, of the woman that I interviewed. So I think, yes, there probably is a, a, a point at which it's not um, universally recognized that there is uh, this, this shift in people. Mm. And one of the things um, uh, that we, you talked about with, with these women as well and part of your research is, is identifying the need to, to, to create your own work-life work blend, your own balance to, to, your, to your work um, and, and home life. And the quote we've got on here is, you have to decide where you want that balance to be and what the compromise is going to be. And that, that's going to be different for every individual, isn't it, Jane? Yes, it is, and it seemed to go through different stages. So several of the, of the women described viewing their time away from work as a completely different experience, and that work felt like it was unrelated to the world they were in when they were off. Mm. And then when they returned, there were great feelings of vulnerability and sometimes grief that were expressed. Um, women yeah. used words such as heartbroken and grieving because of the end of the period and all that that signified. Those are very strong emotive words, aren't they? Is, is there a sense that when people are trying to balance these, these two aspects of their, of their life that they're trying to blend, that there's almost a sense of guilt that they're not giving 100% to either? There can be. And again, I think this is where the coaching seemed to be extremely helpful in, in helping the woman work out exactly what it was that she wanted in her home life and in her work life. So, you know, after returning, you know, one of the win women described it as adjusting to the new no norm. Mm. And if uh, they could really help to identify what was really important to them as a role as a mother and making sure that they incorporated that into their day, they could get the balance, the best balance for them between motherhood and work. Mm. And so the impact of the coaching, I'm guessing that a lot of people go into that coaching process with sort of questions about the logistics of how on earth they balance raising a child or looking after a child with their career. Um, I'm guessing that actually coaching explores a lot of different areas and maybe thinks, uh, maybe make, makes parents think in a different way. Uh, yes, I think because coaching often really helps to increase self-awareness and there's often a chance to have your internal perceptions and assumptions challenged you can then view situations from other perspectives. So whilst women might say, actually, this is what I took to coaching, the logistics of how I was going to manage to do my job and sort out childcare, often there were broader and deeper outcomes to the coaching. So they might take away specific and actionable tasks, but they also found that their self-confidence had increased and they had a renewed focus on their career. Um, planning a positive departure from and return to work and thinking about the best way to reintegrate into the workplace were common, common themes. And the work on priorities and aspirations really often led to personal insights mm. and new realizations about themselves, uh, which then opened up a wider range of possibilities for their futures. Sure, and we've got that quote on the screen there that, that, that says that it's about having someone uh, help you take a step back and give you that different perspective that we talked about. Um, Jane, one, one last thing to, to ask you um, uh, before we move on to the next slide is, I'm guessing with this coaching relationship, it does take some time to build, that there must have to be an element of trust between coach and parent in order for that perspective to start to appear. Just talk us through a little bit about how you found that working. So I think with any coaching relationship, that trust is really important to build, to create mm. that safe environment, to allow those conversations to flow, and for whoever's being coached to feel that they could, can really think about themselves in that safe space. Um, it certainly seems to be easier if the coach is considered to be external and neutral and objective, and seven out of the 11 women really stressed how important it was that, that, that that that's how they saw their coach. Um, one woman really identified the time when she, she really started believing that the coach w wasn't aligned to her organization, and that was the time where she had deepest personal insight and change, um, mm. and that the women really viewed their coaches as a sounding board, and they, they, all, they all had a lot of praise for the coaches that they'd had. Fantastic. Before we, and I'm keen to get the audience back involved and to, and to bring them a, a second poll so they can tell us a little bit more about how they're, they're dealing with this issue. But um, before we do, we've, we've, we've missed off a key perspective which we need to talk about um, uh, now, which is the employer perspective for coaching, Jane. And just 
um, tell us a little bit about how your research, sort of what, what your research revealed from the employer perspective as well as from the parents' perspective. So quite a lot of the women talked about how the, the coaching has really helped them to prepare for uh, potentially difficult conversations that they were anticipating about coming mm. back to work. And one of the real advantages was the coach helping them to see things from the perspective of the organization as well, so that um, there could be a win-win situation. And this is what the woman wanted. But it, was that going to be the best thing for the organization? And if it was, they could really frame it in that way for those conversations. Um, so that really, really helped them. And also sometimes there were feelings of negativity about maybe their line manager or the organization, maybe because of communication, like Jennifer mentioned before, sometimes mm. people not knowing what to say or organizational policies hadn't properly filtered through to every level. But the coaching helped them to see how they could change things. They could change their, take control of their situation a bit more and also be a role model for for women in the future. Um, mm. And if coaching was available for the managers or line manager briefings, that, that was even better. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your insight onto that, Jane. Um, we're we're going we're gonna to come back to you, obviously, and we're going to have some questions for both you and Jennifer very shortly. But before we do that, um, I want to launch our second poll and ask our audience where they are with this. So the question that we're asking now is, what is the biggest barrier or challenge you face in implementing uh, or ensuring success of a coaching program in your organization? Um, we've just opened that poll up now. You can start voting already. Um, option one, getting senior level buy into the business case. Senior level buy in, obviously, a key thing we talk about in Inside HR. Is it option two, getting line managers on board, another key thing we talk about all the time. Option three, communicating the availability of coaching programs and boosting take up. Or is it option four, making sure that we are gender inclusive in any parent transition coaching program. Jennifer mentioned earlier, obviously, um, parents and couples take many different um, forms. Um, so it's really important to make sure that you're inclusive there. The last option is something else. Um, so whatever that is, uh, if it's not, if that's if the, the four pre previously mentioned things aren't the main barrier for you, then just click that fifth option. Um, so people can vote now. Click on that vote button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we've uh, hopefully had already had some questions coming in uh, mm -hmm. from our audience, and we'll take a look at some of those now, Jennifer. Um, good to bring you back in here as well. Um, uh, so what are our audience asking? Let's have a quick look here. So a question here, what strategies should employers and employees adopt to support those returning to work uh, after uh, a longer-term career break after having a family? So. Jennifer, I'm sure you've seen this in the organizations that you're working with. It's not just the sort of, you know, the, the people who are taking maybe nine months to a year off, but actually people who often have a longer career break for whatever reason. So it could be up to sort of two, three, four years. What, what kind of steps can organizations um, take to deal with that kind of transition? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it's, it's kind of everything we're talking about for the maternity adoption or shared parental leave break, which could be three to 12 months plus. Um, and it's a, it's a really important area at the moment. As, as people will know, the government made available a pot of money to invest in women returners and returners of, of any gender coming back to the workplace after a, a, a career break for family. So it's a key time to be looking at that. So I would say all of the things that we do here that take a potential drop in confidence and turn it around by giving people the skills for influential conversation, helping them plan who their stakeholders are, helping them think about obviously practical sides like the care solutions that they need to have in place. We often build care advice. We have care consultants who can come into these programs. So helping people think about the practical day to day of keeping the show on the road. Plus in those cases if you're doing returnships then you need to be helping people think about the jobs they can come back into and, and many organizations will now have schemes whereby they will bring people in, particularly in IT, for example, and banking. There are a lot of schemes where employers will bring in people and support them directly into an operational role. So great question. So I would say it's, it's what we need to do directly around the transition plus more. So that's that one. Mm. We've got a few, um, yeah, we've got a few questions coming in about measuring the return on investment mm -hmm. of coaching, and I know what I'll probably do is, is we'll push those to the end because I know Jennifer, you're about to talk about the business case for investing yeah. in coaching. So I'm sure we'll answer all of those questions as we go through the next 15 minutes or so. Instead, let's have a look at. Um, uh, we t talked about um, earlier, there was, there was a question about how um, co 
organizations want coaching to be available to more than just parents. Actually, there's a lot of people with caring responsibilities, and I know that's mm-hmm. very high on the agenda in organizations at the moment as well. Jennifer, in your experience, is there a way of sort of expanding this to take in all people who have caring roles and are tr- struggling with that balance between mm-hmm. um, sort of you know, their domestic life and the demands and their professional lives? Yeah. Again, great question. Um, at My Family Care, where we talk about combining work and family, we necessarily include in that people that have adult dependents, obviously children with additional needs, elder care responsibilities, such a growing issue potentially for all of us with people living longer, with the retirement age becoming more fluid. So I would say, I mean, of course, all of the services that we provide, be that one-to-one coaching, group coaching, online resources, are also reflected in the caring side of things. So yes, but if you're thinking about your own internal program, the thing I would say is is many organizations, one of your key starting points, whether you're looking at the parent transition or you're looking at wider caring, you can start by establishing a network. It needs a few volunteers. You will usually find a handful of passionate volunteers, and you can call that a family network instead of a parenting network and include carers in that, but definitely creating some kind of place for people to have conversations and exchange their stories and exchange their tips and solutions is really important. So definitely doing something for carers is is a very good move if you're doing something also for parents. Brilliant. We'll just take one more before we move on. Um, And bear in mind, please do keep sending us this because we will have a little bit of time at the end to answer more as well, not just for Jennifer, but also for Jane um, and the research that she's done as well. Um, Last one, Jennifer, just this one's for you again, I guess. Um, Suggestions, the concept of self-coaching and being able to help yourself to, to gain that perspective that Jane was talking about in her research. Do we have any suggestions on how to encourage people self-coaching? That's a lovely question. And, you know, a, a halfway house to that is, as I mentioned earlier, establishing buddies and mentors within an organization, so people that have been working parents to buddy up with each other. It's not self-coaching, but I just wanted to, to keep that idea in people's minds because that can be a very engaging thing to set up. Now, in terms of self-coaching, obviously, if you've provided any online tools, I've talked before about the Parental Leave Toolkit that's used by people like IBM and others, that is a kind of self-coaching because when mm. you engage with that toolkit, you're then invited to, to look at a tool that's going to help you plan a better conversation or review your working arrangements, make the business case for that. If you're starting out as yourself as an organization, you know why not provide some checklists, some guidance, and invite people to self-coach around that. When we've worked with large professional services organizations and we've provided those checklists and they already have a coaching culture, they very much wanted to work with us to produce checklists that put some coaching questions in, you know, sort of what are your values here, what do you definitely want people to understand about your your professional brand as a working Mm. parent, so you can build that in. Fantastic. Let's um, move on. Thank you for all the questions. Like I say, we will do some more at the end. Um, We've talked about the effect on parents um, and the benefits that coaching can provide there. But Jennifer, as always, we need to justify this. We need to talk about the business case. And there is a huge one, isn't there? What will parental transition coaching deliver for organizations. So let's get into the hard numbers, Jennifer. Um, on the screen now, we've got some, some, some of the factors that um, are often impacted with this. Just walk us through a little bit more, Jennifer, what, 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 the, uh, what the return is here. Sure. Many of these factors came from um, a, an expert HR case study that was published about our client Citigroup some years ago, actually, where they yeah. identified in particular the increased return rate and the better engagement, as well as other factors. And I think we'll talk about the return rate in a moment because there have been questions about measuring ROI. And, you know, that's a key one. You don't expect to get everybody back from return because, you know, it is a life transition. People do have a rethink. But you definitely would expect to see an increase in that return rate, and it does happen, and it's measurable. But you need good data, so you need to know what your current return rate is, and you need to look at the, the how the needle is moving. You also perhaps will want to look at how career progression stays on track. Mm. But we do find many of our clients have an engagement survey where they are grouping people according to whether they're working parents, for example, and they can see the engagement levels rise. But you also find if you're keeping people on board through this transition and you're having better conversations, not only does that enhance the diversity of your pipeline because you're keeping more working parents, male and female, 
but you're also having, you know, managers are having better conversations with, with the coming generation about work-life integration, whether or not their parents. And that in turn leads to a better employee value proposition where people feel that their life outside of work can be blended with their career and you can have conversations yeah. about that. And this is really high on the agenda at the moment, isn't it? I mean, for example, I know that my organization and lots of others at the moment are publishing their gender pay gap reporting, which is something that obviously is mandatory now uh, for organizations over a certain size. And if you want, if organizations want women in more, sen in more, more women in senior roles, then surely one of the things worth doing is looking at those key life moments where women can drop out of the talent pipeline. And this is, this is going to affect all kinds of things, including things like gender pay. Yeah. Absolutely, I um, I couldn't agree more, James. <laughs> so no, so it's just just in terms of reinforcing the number of perspectives that businesses should be looking at with this. Um, if we move it on um, and talk about the size of the challenge that businesses are facing at the moment, we've discussed so far how individuals will feel more valued, how they'll be able to return to work more confidently, more able to perform, more ambitious. Um, in addition to that, there's numbers behind this in terms of the return on investment for addressing this. Jennifer, just walk us, because we, we all know how senior executives like to see those numbers, put, it, put the business case in, in pounds and pence. So take us through that and, yeah. and tell us what organizations can be doing. And rightly so. I mean, you, you know, it's important to look at the numbers. We can see from a human perspective, it's the right thing to do, and it's mm. going to have many spin-off benefits. But the numbers are important. So we know from experience, from population figures, that between 1% and 7% of your population will be on either maternity adoption or paternity, some kind of new parent leave at any one time. Um, we know that the national average maternity return rates um, are in the region of 77%. We know that from the Office for National Statistics. Um, so you can expect around about 70%, 77% of people to return if you don't do anything else. It will be very different in different sectors. Sometimes it will be much less. Sometimes mm. it may be higher. We know that it costs at least a £30,000 ticket to replace somebody who chooses not to return. Now, it'll Which be a, a lot more. figure, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, but, it, you know, many of our investment banking clients would say, you know, don't be ridiculous, it's quarter of a million by the time that associate sure. has been with us 10 yeah. years and the, the knowledge yeah. they represent. Plus, you know, they may not stay at home with their children. They may actually go to one of your competitors who provides a better work-life balance. Um, which is quite costly too. Um, so, so, you know, those are quite important figures. And looking at the return on investment when you do get hold of this transition and provide things that enable people, you can see an increase in return rate. You can see on the screen at the moment, Northern Rose Fulbright's measured mm. the, the increase in the, the retention in the, the return rate and found that that climbed 14 percentage points. Page Group, who we've also published a case study on our work with Page Group, they found that there was a 12% increase in their return rates. These so, are big, tangible increases, Jennifer. Well, they are. They, you know, they make a huge difference financially as well as in terms of, mm. of morale and continuity. So let's say you had 1,000 employees just for the sake of round numbers. Sure. If 4% of your population was on maternity leave at any one time, then you'd have 40 people out of that 1,000 that would be mm -hmm. going through leave. If you could increase the return rate by 12 percentage points, taking that national average of 77%, adding 12 percentage points onto that takes it up to 89%. If you had 77% of those 40 people return, you'd have, slightly odd in terms of people, but you'd have 30.8 people returning, so just over yeah. 30 people. You would increase it um, to 35.6 people, so 35 or 36 people coming back instead of 30 people if you move it up 12 percentage points. So say that's an extra 4.8 well, we'll or 5 people, mm. that in monetary terms is quite a lot, isn't it? Well, yes, you know, it's, it's 144K if you take 4.8 people. If you took 4 people coming back times 30,000, it's 120,000. Use that 30 grand 000. figure, yeah. And you can run a substantial program or internal networks or whatever else you wish to do or, you know, create management guidance for 144K. That's <laughs> You really could. That's a, that's a huge figure. My company wouldn't know what to do with that amount of money. Um, Norton Rose Fulbright um, is, is a really interesting example. That's obviously one of the case studies that we've got a link mm -hmm. to in the attachments. Just again, just to reinforce, 14% on uh, increase on return rates. Um, and that was uh, something that was... Um, obviously the most tangible benefit to, to, mm -hmm. to, to, to maternity and paternity coaching. Um, but there are other success factors, aren't there, as well, Jennifer, um, that, we need to, that we need to look at? 
Yeah, and interestingly, some of our law firm clients have said to us, we will know this program is a success when we are getting better thought through flexible working applications. Mm. And that's a really smart way of looking at it because, as Jane referenced earlier, the coaches would challenge the individual to make a really good business case for their preferred working arrangements, thinking through the deliverables, thinking through the contingencies and how it's going to work. So the coaching can have a really practical impact in that way as well. But on the screen now, you can see six success factors that we've identified through coaching thousands of working parents and their line managers. We, we know what we're looking to, to shift here. And if you look at those factors and the increases, what we're looking at there is we ask people to rate on a scale of 1 to 10 how they feel on each of these six factors before mm -hmm. coaching and after. And the percentage increase is the change. So if you've got a 46% uplift in confidence, which we had across all of our clients, you know, the average from last year, that's, you know, they're half as confident again as before they had the coaching, which is quite significant. And this is on top of the sort of the usual sort of feel-good approval stats that you get as well. Absolutely. We had 100% of people in that same period of, of the whole of last year saying that they found their coach engagement, uh, sorry, found their coach engaging, and 98% said that the coaching supported relevant objectives, which were about having a smooth transition, feeling valued, and so on, and a net promoter score of 74, which is pretty good. Brilliant. So we've just got 10 minutes left, and I'm anxious to get questions, and I'm anxious, Jennifer, also for you to talk about the big picture and where we go from here. But before we do that, let's get those poll results in. So remember we asked, what's the biggest barrier or challenge you face in implementing or ensuring the success of your coaching program? Um, option one, getting senior uh, level buy-in, which is obviously something we talk about a lot. 44% of our respondents responded to that, and a quarter um, talked about getting line managers on board. So Jennifer, it's the usual story, senior buy-in and and uh, devolving this policy to the line managers. Mm. Yeah, we, we ran a big think tank session in the room with our client HSBC who kindly hosted us a, a couple of weeks ago and we went through figures like we just did for the return on investment in terms of return mm. and, and a lot of people said that was the one thing they were going to take away was to look at those figures internally and make the case to get senior level buy-in. And what I would say is once you've got the buy-in, can you find a senior champion to back a program, whether you're bringing in external providers or whether you're simply making this happen internally? If you can get a senior champion who will put the message out, then you can name to get line managers on board because it's coming from the highest level to say, look, this is how we want to be as an employer of choice. So those are the tips I would say for those two, two points there. Brilliant. And, and let's move on to some of your, your bigger picture tips as well, Jennifer. We, let's summarize some of the things that employers can do right now. Yes, so thinking about an integrated approach, we've talked about the way coaching impacts development and well-being for the individual, but not to forget leadership and management. You know, we'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, but the enablers mm. and tools, these can be very, very practical. Obviously, childcare, we provide a lot of backup childcare when you first come back to work. After having a child and your child's newly in a childcare setting, there can be all sorts of coughs and colds and childcare hiccups. If you can smooth the way with backup care or ongoing care advice, that can be really helpful. Technology that helps people work in more agile ways so that you've got alternatives of how people balance work and life. Um, but also enablers from a policy point of view. I've seen a few questions about pay. Um, certainly enhancing pay for shared parental leave is a good idea, um, but also considering things like a phased return. Can you allow people to use up holidays or indeed use keeping in touch days mm. to enable a phased return so they're back a couple of days a week before they're back full time? So practical things like that. And then finally, back to the leadership and management side and perhaps onto the next slide. We've talked about the cultural need, the need for the business case. We've talked about senior level buy-in. The power of a checklist, I can't overstate it. You can see on the screen there's a couple of people using the, the parental leave toolkit here that, that guides you through you know, tips and, on what to do at each stage. But mm. you know, we have seen people say to us again and again, I am having a conversation now because you've given it a name. You know, you've given it the, the pre-leave pre discussion name. You've given it a checklist, and suddenly we've got permission to speak. So whether you do that internally, whether you, you bring help in to do that, it really is a starting point, I would say. And Jane Moffat, who's done our research, is also still with us. Jane, is there anything you'd like to add to what Jennifer's just said there in terms of the key things that you would pick out from the research you did? I think she's covered it all. I think having the, the important conversations at the crucial time, um, 
and you know planning them in is really really important and um yeah i think i think jennifer has covered everything else there Fantastic. All right, we've got some time now. We've got about six minutes to get some questions in, um, and we've got some fantastic ones. Thank you so much for sending those in. Um, here's a question for Jennifer. When you run the in-company coaching days or um, other days that we've talked about, what sort of number of participants do you normally work with in a session? Yeah, great question. Um, I would say something like 6 to 12 or 15 is an average. That's a great number to get good conversations going. And a similar number on virtual group coaching is really effective. We can also do great things for people. You know, today we've got well over 600 people on this webinar today. Um, we do a lot of big broadcast webinars to hundreds of people, and it's not the intimate space where people are unmuted and they speak up, but it's very effective for going through case studies, for sharing tips. So you can tailor it to the size of your audience. You can network people across the world if you find the right time zone and mm. you know, take groups of whatever size. But where you are doing um, a group coaching session in, a, in a, a room together, I would say you know, around about the sort of 12 to 15 is about the level. Fantastic. We've got a great question here that uh, actually I'll get both of your perspective on. My organization has access to coaches, but how do I, as an HR manager, know that the coaches are equipped to deliver maternity and parental coaching? What kind of mm. things should HR be looking for when engaging a coaching service? Well, that's, that's a really good question. If you have internal coaches, and we have developed a lot of internal coaches within our, our client organizations, law firms, professional services firms, um, we worked with KPMG, for example, with their internal coaches as well as the individuals, and, and they you know, were recognized for that provision in terms of awards. Though they've got brilliant internal coaches, um, like many organizations that have the, the resource, the, the, you know, they're privileged to have those internal coaches. Those coaches can be brilliant leadership and career coaches. Mm. Um, you can bring in expertise to to raise the awareness of those coaches around the themes of the maternity paternity transition. You can provide checklists. You can work together on case studies. So we've often done you know, a, a day or two with internal coach teams to focus on maternity paternity, and then you're sure that the coaches have really focused in on, on that area. Brilliant. And Jane, just quickly, from the research and the conversations you had with the women that you talked to for your research, what were sort of the key things that they were looking for in a coach? Um, somebody who had an understanding of the situation that they might be in, so either people who worked in the same area or who had coached other people who'd worked in that area and had that understanding of this time of great transition. Mm. Brilliant. We've got um, an interesting one here, actually, Jennifer. Um, we re uh, this is, this is uh, the question speaking. We retain mothers returning from one year away on their first baby. However, the retention rate for us drops considerably when they have baby number two. Mm. What ways can we help mothers who are struggling at this particular time? Yeah, it's a great question, James. And I can see it also kind of relates to another question that's come in that says, how long after returning do you capture the measurement? People may leave six to nine sure. months. So they come back initially, and then after sort of nine months to a year, they then leave. Yeah, so these are two very realistic perspectives which should come across all the time. The attrition, you know, when people have, have been there, they've kind of sustained the effort to keep it going for a while and then they reconsider. Or as that questioner has put it, child two comes along or three or four and, you know, the, the cost of childcare can become decisive at that point. One of the things I would say is the people that we have come across that have had coaching the second time around or access to networks, which again you can create internally, mm. they have said, look, one of the things I really lack at this time because I'm already a busy working parent, I lack the time, the space, the structure. So if you can create through networks, through coaching, through however you can, the space for people to have the structure, the sense that they, they do belong, you are more likely to keep them. And you will also find that they can exchange tips on making it work. Because that's often one of the things, there's a kind of loneliness and isolation through thinking you're the only one that must be working this hard to keep sure. it all on the road. And plus, somebody else had typed in earlier about the need for gender inclusion, you yep. know, that men that women will not be equal at work until men are equal at home. And I think anything we can do to encourage um, every, every parent in a relationship to, to think about how you share the domestic workload as well as uh, the professional side, that's going to be a, a help as well. 
Brilliant. Okay, we've got about 90 seconds left, so I've probably got time for one, possibly two questions. So let's try and we get, get through this one. It's quite a long one. Um, we currently offer one year off paid maternity leave and four weeks enhanced paternity leave. We don't currently really use kit days effectively, and we talked about this earlier, but we would like to add more. Um, returning mothers may not return to their previous team, therefore we would like to offer other coaching to facilitate a smooth return to work. How can this company, Jennifer, um, make these kit days more effective and smooth that transition? Yes, and I think it's a really good point where you're not returning to the same team. We mm. work, again, with a lot of people that, you know, there are, there are there is flux, there is change. And one of the things we would say on a keeping in touch day, think about who else you could talk to on that day, who will be your stakeholders, your champions, your allies in your new team. Can you build in a meet and greet? Can your new manager reach out to you? And, you know, a little bit like an induction, which you would do for a new starter, orient you to what's happening. So I think that's a really good way of, of using a keep in touch day. Can I just pick up, I've just seen a question where somebody said that they were surprised that the, there was only 20% on feeling valued and supported in those stats I shared earlier. Yeah. I wanted to, to just underline, it doesn't mean only 20% of people felt valued and supported. It means that we added an increase of 20% on top of how valued and supported they sure. already were. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, those, what, those figures that we had on that slide were the percentage increase year on year, weren't they? So yeah, it wasn't, yeah. It wasn't just the 20% standard alone. Um, unfortunately, uh, sadly, Jane and Jennifer, that is all we have time for this morning. It's been a real, really packed hour. Thank you so much, and a huge thank you to my family carers always, um, who we love working with, and, and who these these webinars really do um, uh, have such a popular uptake uh, when we when we work with you. So a big thank you to them, to Jennifer, and to Jane. Um, I just want to leave you with uh, the resources that we have under the attachments tab. So if you please click on that button, and there is a whole range of resources from my from my family care and links to their website, including case studies, videos, white papers, research and service guides, and their parental leave toolkit as well, and those case studies from Sky, from Norton Rose Fulbright, and from IBM that we talked about earlier. So huge amounts of stuff to take away uh, to help you start that process. If that's you, if you're in that 66% that are looking to start this process of, get, of getting a coaching program in to support your working parents, um, please do take advantage of all of those resources. Um, we are um, done for the hour. Thank you so much for tuning in to Inside HR. Thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.